Coming up on the CHRO Noon Edition. Captured. Ottawa Carleton Regional Police nab another murder suspect. Words, not war, working in native land claim talks at Golden Lake. And 40,000 fans take a tour of Ottawa's new Palladium. Good afternoon. A two-week-long manhunt in Ottawa is finally over. Yesterday morning, Ottawa Carleton police raided a Vanier apartment where they arrested 28-year-old Martin Pincus. Pincus was the second suspect wanted in the murder of gas station attendant Danny Jones, who was killed at work in the village of Edwards. Wyman Hadley was arrested last week. The shooting is believed to be a drug-related settling of accounts. Ottawa Carleton police say they also know a lot more about the city's 16th homicide this year after receiving a phone call Sunday. 32-year-old Carrie Dolores Mancuso was found asphyxiated in her apartment building Thursday. An anonymous tip led police to the site. On Saturday, police had asked the anonymous man to come forward, and yesterday he did with more information. Police are still searching for a suspect in the killing. Members of the Kettle and Stony Creek First Nation will bury one of their own today. Hundreds are expected to attend the funeral of Anthony George at the military base in Ipperwash near London. He will be buried on land the group insists belongs to them. George was shot last Wednesday during a confrontation between protesters and provincial police. Meanwhile, Federal Indian Affairs Minister Ron Irwin is to arrive in Ipperwash on Wednesday. It's expected he will join in talks to bring a peaceful end to the standoff that has pitted natives against police. In marked contrast to what's happening at Ipperwash, native land claim talks in the Ottawa Valley remain ongoing and civil. That's because Chief Robert White Duck, head of the Algonquin First Nation, believes that words, not weapons, are the best way to resolve differences. Negotiation, not confrontation, is the most effective way to resolve land claim disputes. So says Robert White Duck, chief of the Algonquin Golden Lake First Nation. Despite uh, what's perceived as uh, and been referred to in some terms of general unrest among Native communities, I think you'll see that uh, there's still a firm commitment and a belief among uh, the First Nation leadership across the country to the negotiation process and a cooperative framework that we can outline and define our relationship with the rest of Canada. For almost five years, White Duck has been involved in talks with the federal and provincial governments. The Algonquin land claim covers some 34,000 square kilometers. That includes Parliament Hill and much of Algonquin Park. Uh, we'd like this thing to end yesterday morning. Uh, it's time consuming for us. It's difficult for us. And as well, it's, it's costly for us. It's, it's not like it's, it's certainly not a make work project. It's, it's the most significant priority that we have as a people. <laughs> White Duck says Canadians should be concerned if there is a significant breakdown in negotiations, but so far that has not happened. And that, he feels, is reason to be optimistic. I think within a year you'll see some, uh, some substantive and uh, concrete uh, developments in the negotiations. I think we, uh, we owe it to ourselves as negotiators, and we owe it to, uh, to the Algonquins, and we certainly owe it to the rest of Canada. Dan Nesnick, CHRO News at the Algonquin Golden Lake First Nation Reserve. A report says the province is ready to pull the plug on its legal aid plan that could leave, the, leave thousands of accused without publicly funded legal help. Sources tell the Toronto Star the details are expected by midweek. The report says only those convicted of serious crimes such as murder and kidnapping would get a lawyer paid by the state. Ontario's legal aid plan has been targeted for cuts because of a $70 million deficit. Well, these are tough financial times for communities in the Ottawa Valley, among other places. Earlier this summer, the Harris government announced it will slash municipal funding by 20%. Now, local councils are starting to realize the actual dollar amount they stand to lose. Dave Henderson has more from Arne Pryor, where the town faces a possible cut of $90,000. Like all Ontario communities, the town of Armfire is facing a sudden cash crunch. That crunch comes in the form of a 20% cut in provincial grants, courtesy of Mike Harris's Common Sense Revolution. It's going to be significant because uh, they have to be real cuts. Um, Armfire Mayor Kevin McDonald says if the cuts are made to unconditional grants, it'll mean a $90,000 shortfall in the town's finances. 
Mary McDonald says council is already looking at ways to save dollars. That, uh, I'm proposing to set up a small ad hoc committee of the council to work with staff to work out these cuts because uh, I don't believe there's uh, enough fat in the budget to be able to make those kind of cuts without uh, having some effect on the services that we produce. Communities like Armprior will know more when the Ontario government issues a financial statement next month. But the mayor says what's really sobering about the whole process is that this is not a one-time cut. Well, it's going to be a number of tough years, I'm afraid. Uh, this, uh, the indication that I got from the conferences that I've been at, particularly the AMO conference most recently in Toronto, um, all of the politicians that spoke made it quite clear that this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the provincial deficit is still, even with these cuts, in the neighborhood of $8 billion. And with the provincial government dedicated to reducing that deficit, local politicians like Kevin McDonald have some painful choices in the future, choices that will likely include raising taxes and reducing services. In Armprior, Dave Henderson, CHRO News. An Ottawa pilot is singing in an attempt to save the nation. David Austin's musical unity campaign is set for national release later today, but Michael O'Byrne managed to get a sneak preview of the song, the video, and the vision. Let's keep flying together. We are birds of a feather. It's a simple song, a sensational video, with a sincere message. We join and stand our ground. I'm not against any politician or any organization. I'm just for Canada. I love you. He is 50-year-old pilot and performer David Austin. David wrote the song. Canada's top country music producer, Randall Prescott of Ottawa, pieced together the video. Nobody's taking Canada away from us. We're giving it away. And so my thought is, let's let everybody know we want to keep flying together, we want to stay together. Let's just try to work out the problems. We can build a great nation instead of tearing it down. The reason we did it in English and in French is, and not bilingual, is because we wanted to touch the English people and we wanted to touch the French people separately. We wanted them to feel it in their own language. I will protect you. I want the world to see you are a part of me. Everything in our life is going to go. Friends die, things go. And, uh, but I don't want to give up this country. I know the CD, cassette, and video will be sold in Sam the Record Man stores across Canada. Michael O'Byrne, BBS News, Ottawa. More news is ahead on the CHRO Noon Edition, including a rock and roll revival in Ottawa, where hundreds of Beatles fans prove the Fab Four is still as popular now as they were in the 60s. The Noon Edition. Brought to you in part by Subway. Well, if advanced crowds are any indication, the Ottawa Senators should be a huge success at the Palladium. It was open house at the construction site yesterday with some 40,000 people showing up to tour the rink. In fact, by late afternoon, they had to close the doors because traffic on the road leading into the new arena was at a standstill. CHRO's Brian Parker reports. There wasn't a seat in the house, but that didn't stop yeah. thousands of hockey fans from Ottawa and the Valley from attending the Palladium's first open house. In fact, crowds were so large, the team says they're going to have to do this again. Club is looking for a way to help boost lagging ticket sales. And while opening night at the Palladium is still over four months away, there is obviously a lot of interest in the Senators soon to be home. It's more people than we thought would come. Uh, we expected a good turnout, but it is, uh, it is more than we had expected. And of course, the public generally are theoretically not supposed to be here until just about now. Uh, so it's been terrific. The open house was supposed to run from 2 until 6 with the morning session for season ticket holders, but that went by the wayside early in the day when the general public started showing up in the hundreds. In fact, the city has never seen so much interest in a construction site before. And even though there's still a lot of work to do, most people, well, they're pretty impressed. It's just super, and I, you can see anywhere. I gather right from the top. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. Great. We've, this is our fourth year, and uh, we're keen. And the Senators are going to do well this year. <laughs> oh, you bet your boots. My God, this is progress, man. This is progress. But they've got to keep you icing. <laughs> got to keep icing. We're from Perth, and we just thought to come up and take a look. It's been such a nice day, you know. Yeah, it's just so huge, eh? It's just it's 
just in awe, I guess. Pretty awesome. Opening night for hockey is scheduled for mid-January when the Montreal Canadiens open up a nine-game homestand for the Senators, and everything right now is still running on schedule. We're about 17 weeks away from opening, Brian, and we think that we'll be there, no problem, January 15th. In Ottawa, Brian Parker, CHRO Sports. Yesterday's weren't so far away for hundreds of Ottawa music fans this weekend. The first ever Beatles convention held in the national capital was a big hit with the backbeat of a mythical guest. John Ruttle has more. Are they songs of the last generation or timeless classics? No argument here, as hundreds pay 20 bucks a head to soak up Beatles memorabilia. There's so much a part of our culture that we're not even aware of how much. I mean, the way we dress, the way we act, the, all the musicians are influenced by them one way or another. The first ever Beatles convention in Ottawa boasts the backdrop of Liverpool's famous cavern stage and collectibles from 60s musical history. Parents are teaching their kids about the best band in the world. They were vibrant and alive, and they were a band that reflected the times, I guess. Don, who are the Beatles? Wait, no Pete? The Pete Best table's in the front right here, so if you're first in line... Then why all the crowd control? Pete Best, the Beatles drummer! A convention coup, the Beatles' first drummer, Pete Best, now in his own band that plays tributes to his former band. The 53-year-old drummer has no regrets. When I look back at it, uh, I think I've been fortunate because um, there's a lot of things which compensated, you know, for my demise from show business, but I've got a great family, you know, great kids, uh, great social life back home in England when I'm there. And here they line up for a copy of his signature, a brush with greatness. Well, almost. Isn't Pete Best like this tragic footnote of history? You're telling me. <laughs> I can imagine how he feels actually now. Pete Best plays tonight, headlining the convention, second to no one. I'm John Ruddle in Ottawa. Canada has a new champion, and she's a master at what she does. Winnipeg's Patty Kosturuk took top prize at the Canadian Grand Masters Fiddling Championships held this weekend in Nepean. Derek Miller dropped by to see the best in a sea of champions. There's stress, there's precision, but there's one sound that makes it not so bad. This is not a competition for wimps. Only the best are invited. At the very worst, the losers are still Grand Masters. At the best, they leave $3,000 richer. A contest like this is all kinds of pressure because, you know, everybody wants to do well at it because you're playing against your peers from all over the country. So, yeah, there's tons of pressure. Meet Rob Dejeuner, a well-known fixture in the Ottawa Valley. He's been the three-time Ontario champion and the Canadian Open champ. He's indisputably a natural, and even the naturals have to work at it whenever they can. The face of fiddling has evolved dramatically over the last couple of decades. The new face is fresher and has a few more freckles. The average age here is about 25 or younger. Enter 13-year-old Mark Sullivan. Now we'll have a medley in B-flat starting with high-level hornpipe. What do you like about performing? Uh, I just like to play and like to go to the contest because I meet a lot of new friends. And... What does it do to you up there in front of a bunch of people and they're watching you and hey, you got a standing ovation tonight? Uh, pretty, I feel pretty happy about it. Pretty proud, I guess. <laughs> Derek Miller in Ottawa. Next, this fall's new TV lineup includes some big changes to CHRO news programming. News director Richard Gray will join us to explain the improvements we're making. That and more when the CHRO Noon Edition continues. Closed captioning for the Noon Edition is brought to you by Arn Pryor Guardian Drugs. You've probably noticed some changes to our show today. First, there's a new name. We're now the CHRO Noon Edition. And over the course of the program, you'll also notice we've got a new look. These are just a few of the things that are different about CHRO news programming this fall. Joining us to talk about what's happening is news director Richard Gray. And Richard, first, uh, why are these changes uh, to news programming being made? I guess, Dan, maybe we can blame it on the change in the temperature. It is, of course, fall, and we're into a, a, 
a new television season here at, at CHRO, and uh, we decided that it was, it was time for a change with respect to the look of all of the programs. We've been doing things the same way for probably the last four to five years. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and we thought probably our audience uh, was ready for us to try something new. So what we're generally trying to do is, is pick up the pace of the shows, and uh, in a few minutes we can get into a little bit more detail about specifically what's going to be happening to each one. As you mentioned, fall, it's the perfect time. I've noticed on the network there have been uh, little changes, cosmetic changes. Uh, those are some of the things the viewers will notice right off the top. Uh, yeah. What about some of the other things specifically? Well, specifically, one of the bigger changes that we're going to be making is, is going to be a content change. Um, what we're going to be doing is, is reorienting our resources to, to local news reporting, covering stories here in the Ottawa Valley, covering the people, places, and, and happenings of, of communities like Iron Pryor and Renfrew and Pembroke, Petawawa, Deep River, Chalk River. Eganville over into, into Western Quebec. Um, that is what our audience wants to see, um, so that's what we're going to give them. Now what about supper time news? I understand uh, there will be a number of changes uh, um, at that time of the day as well. One of the, one of the most significant changes that we're going to be making is, is at supper time. No longer, no longer will our show be on from 5.30 to 6.30. It's going to be a condensed half hour beginning at 6 o'clock. And everybody is still going to be able to tune in to CHRO's news and, and, and get the latest stories on, on world happenings and national events. But again, the focus is very much going to be on, on what's going on here and going on in Ottawa. And what we're going to be doing is relying on our Baton sister station, CJOH, to, providing a, to provide us with more material from Ottawa. Again, that, that half hour at 6 o'clock is going to be a comprehensive news, weather, and sports package. Kathy Cox is going to continue mm -hmm. as, as our main news anchor there with Brian Parker doing sports and Bob Cowan so again continuing on the weather. So it's going to be uh, a much faster paced show I guess because uh, the time has been cut in half. Without question it's going to be a much more fast paced half hour and again people are, are, are going to be able to get everything that they want and desire from a news program inside of that half hour beginning at six. As you said a few moments ago there certainly is an appetite for uh, local news, even though we're going towards a 500 channel universe, uh, people uh, have to turn in, to tune into their local station uh, to find out what is going on in their backyard. And Generally that's what the viewers want to see. They want to see what, uh, what's going on in their community, so that's what we're going to provide. Okay, now uh, one of the biggest changes taking place is uh, at 11.30. Uh, can you fill us in on, on what's going on then? Yeah, that is a very, very significant change, and, and uh, what is going to happen is um, we're going to change the format of our late night show that immediately follows the CTV national news from, from an all sports program to almost an entirely news program. Mm -hmm. um, Rhonda London is going to be the main anchor of that show, and uh, what people can expect to see from that program, again, is... Um, uh, a, a recap of what's been happening here in the Pembroke area, the Upper Ottawa Valley, in the city of Ottawa. Um, we will also be covering some of the most significant provincial stories that have occurred over the course of the day. Um, there will be a very small sports segment, and again, we'll have a full weather recap. So that you know, it's a, it's a program that I think viewers will really enjoy at 11:30, and will follow the uh, the national, the CTV national news with Lloyd Robertson very well from 11 to 11.30. It certainly seems to make a lot of sense. Now, well, that takes care of Monday to Friday. Uh, what about weekends and any other changes that you can there is there, there is one significant change with respect to the weekends. We have a new weekend report team. Caroline Redekop is going to be handling the news for us and Colin Trithui, um the sports. And um, that's going to be a self-contained team. They're, uh, they're going to come in Saturday and Sunday and, and handle news, weather, and sports both of those days. And again, the reason that we're making that change is that it's going to allow us to free some, um, some of the resources that we've been dedicating to Saturdays and Sundays into, uh, into you know, a Monday to Friday news reporting role. Um, one of the other things I, I'd really like to encourage people to do is to, uh, to pick up the phone and give us a call if they've got any comments, positive or negative, about the changes that we're making. We really want to hear from our viewers. We want to know what they want and expect from, from our news programming. So uh, hopefully they will pick, us, pick up the phone and give us a call make things as interactive as possible. Yeah, very much so. You know, that, uh, again, like I said, um, we are here for, for the people at home. We're, you know, sometimes we, we, we sit in our offices and we get a little bit separated from, from uh, the job it is that we're, we're trying to do. And, and hopefully, you know, this is an opportunity for, our, again, for, for us to sort of 
step back and, and reorient ourselves. Okay, thank you very much, Richard. We'll Thanks, look forward Dan. to those changes. Coming up on the CHRO Noon Edition, what to do if you suffer in late summer from ragweed allergies, and new evidence shows male fertility concerns that have lasted nearly 50 years are just not true. Don't go away, medical news is still to come. CHRO-TV wants to hear from you. Contact us with your news tips or about your community events by phone, by fax, or by email.